Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth. Peace of the Lord be with you this evening. Well, my dear baptized friends, I'm glad I'm able to be with you again and that the mission trip can continue with Pastor. Tomorrow we'll be celebrating or observing tonight the Feast of the Holy Trinity. So what? What has that Trinity got to do with anything? Our salvation? Well, I've heard all these questions before, but we will see it has a great deal to do with everything, with our salvation and all that we have. It's an extremely important teaching of the Bible. Today is, or tomorrow will actually be also Father's Day. Not a Christian holiday, but like Mother's Day, it's worth observing. And all of these are brought together on the Sabbath day for Christians Sunday. And the gospel reading add to that a discussion of demons. So, along with this crazy world we're living in, what do I talk to you about this evening? Well, how about all of them? And I promise I'll keep it under an hour. Well, let's take a look. Marsha, make sure my sermons are kept in a decent time frame. Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you. In the name of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. You are here, or you would be tomorrow, but this evening, actually, Sabbath begins Saturday at sundown. You are here on the Christian Sabbath then. The Christians early on move Sabbath to Sunday always to remember the resurrection of our Lord from the dead, which is what Peter preached on. So each Sunday is vitally important to you and me, to everyone of all ages. For on this day, remembering the Sabbath is about sitting at the feet of Jesus because he has done so much for us and continues to do everything for us that we cannot do for ourselves. And when you're sitting at the feet of Jesus, it means you are sitting at the Father's feet as well. Well, as he teaches us in the Lord's Prayer, our Father who art in heaven, that's what Jesus taught. And with these words, God tenderly invites us to believe that he is our true father and we are his true children so that with all boldness and confidence we may ask him as dear children, ask their dear father. Sound familiar? And there's nothing a father loves to desire to do more than this. That his children come to him and ask what they need. Especially when times are in trouble. So let's take a moment and look on this day of Father's Day or tomorrow if you're taking your father out or what, however you celebrate to, to correct a fatal error. Mortal sinful thinking of God our Father in heaven in terms of our fathers on earth. It's most certainly true that he commands us to honor our fathers as well as our mothers that it may be well with us that we will live long upon the earth. And I'm sure that sounds familiar. It's from where? Catechism, some of you are remembering this. That is, we should fear, love God, that we do not despise or anger our parents and other authorities, but honor them, serve and obey, love and cherish them. Yeah, Luther's small catechism. And we do this because he has created and given us fathers to reflect him and his will and his love, not because fathers are some perfect person without of need of God's fatherly goodness or God's mercy. Knowing that they too, me included as a father, we're sinners. And there's too many examples of men who have been horribly abusive and careless and absent in their God-given roles as fathers in this fallen, fallen world. None of that is neither reason to dishonor a father nor to reject the fatherhood of God as some kind of male conspiracy 
to, to dominate women. It's always a grave mistake and the height of prideful sinning to reject God's gifts or even God himself based upon a shortfall or something that happens within a man or all men. We always need to look to God and his word and command regarding these things of this world, and most importantly about himself, rather than to measure him by the things of this world or to construct our own qualifications, or find our own qualities and expectations of what we think Father should do and of what we think God should be. And it's the same is true of all things, that he has established for us and given to us for our benefit, both in heaven and on earth, such as his church, and his ministry, his worship, his sacraments, godly marriage, godly families, and godly order in our homes and schools and workplaces and society. That's what he has established. Jesus himself came not for his own sake or to do his own will, but for the sake of the will of his Father for us. For in his own earthly life, he submitted to all the orders and established institutions of God, his Father. He submitted to the government that crucified him. He submitted to all the institutions and fulfilled them in order to make them holy for us, to be honored and cherished as those things by which we're not, we may not live long on the earth, but forever with him as Father in heaven. So sitting at the feet of Jesus is not other than remembering the Sabbath day to keep it holy, not to despise its preaching or his word, by which all good gifts of heaven and earth are given and established and provided for us daily, but holding it sacred and gladly hearing and learning it for this very reason. You're catching on, I suppose. I'm looked over my catechism a lot this time for this sermon. But in this and only in this is the love of God. In this and only in this is the way, the truth, and the life by which we come to the Father. Why? Why does he do it that way? Because Jesus is the word of God made flesh, who he himself is the way, the truth, and the life who comes to us and takes us to our Father in heaven. All else is sitting at the feet of the Father of lies. Now you either sit at the feet of Jesus, the way to heaven, truth and life, or you are kissing the feet of the evil one as he leads you on the way to hell, paved with lives of temptation that make sin appealing but are the fruit by which you will surely die and suffer eternal death. In our sacrament of holy baptism, we hear and confess these words. The word of God also teaches that we are conceived and born sinful and under the power of the devil until Christ claims us as his own, which is what he's doing in baptism. So then you are either a slave to devil or you are a child of God. There is no in between. There's no choice. Now you may look at the gospel lesson today, as well as many other biblical accounts of the demonic presence and think, well, those are products of less evolved minds or lack scientific explanation or enlightenment or technology of advances. We can now diagnose and treat all those things that appear to be supernatural forces of evil and the works of demons. But that's the way the world has gone. But just because we have earthly, human, developed explanations and treatments, treatments that might work, or seem to work anyhow. To one extent or another does not mean that demons and the evil father does not exist. Death is proof enough of that. For the Lord revealed to us in the Genesis account, the inspired writer puts it this way, 
at the beginning of all things. As we read the scripture, the evil one is the source of sin. He tempted Eve. And he brought death into the world. Well, look, it's not as if we don't have demons today. Evil is rampant in our world. And yes, I know I've mentioned it before, but take a little time for it. I've met them at Cook County Jail years ago when I was the chaplain there for the district. And also every pastor, I think, would confess, yeah, I've run into a demon. The psychologists at the jail in charge, not believing in the demonic, would give them shots of Thorazine and wrap them up in these belts and confine them to private cells. Because that's all they could do. There's other demonic things as well. The terror of Islam and its culture of murder and death and abuse of infants and children in the name of a false god. That is truly demonic. And every false religion or false teaching within the Christian church that makes righteousness and holiness and even salvation matters for you and I to decide or to earn or to win by our own good work. That is demonic. And today our own culture and spirit of this age not only tolerates and even extols sin and its virtues and doesn't just walk but jumps headlong into death in the name of fun and excitement and self-fulfillment. That is de demonic. And then there's even sickness and disease, whether it's physical, mental, or emotional. All these are thorns of the flesh that are messengers from Satan, as we learn from St. Paul, and the thorn that he prayed to be removed from him. But as we learn from Paul's experience and example, God's grace in Christ is sufficient for you. It is sufficient for us to get us through the attacks of the evil one. And it is the grace of God that exposes evil, casting light into darkness and sending the evil one and all his foot soldiers away. Note that in the presence of Jesus that outs the demons and casts them away, even those who fall down before him, as we see in today's gospel. Excuse me, it was last week's gospel. It is still even for us today. For the moment our Lord comes to us, he is shining the light of his word and truth and casting the father of evil away from us in holy baptism. He works forgiveness for us. He rescues us from death and the devil and gives us eternal salvation to all believe this words and promises. God's grace is sufficient for you. And in these evil times, as they get worse, we need to take that to heart even more. It always overcomes and casts out and delivers us from evil. In a sense, then, the baptismal life of the Christian church is a continuous exorcism. And it's indicated in the holy baptism practice all the way back to Luther in his day. And many churches throughout the ages would say in the baptismal service. Now, I've used this on occasion in churches. Only to enlighten them. But you would take the baby in your arms and you would go. Depart, unclean spirit, receive now the Holy Spirit. That was the baptism. That it's become a little too difficult for people to accept. But the Holy Spirit is present. Jesus, the word, overcomes all the evil ones. He casts them away. And every baptized member of his church who gathers together in his name 
we learn, as Luther taught us, the Holy Spirit is present, reading and repetition and meditation of the catechism and in the entire Holy Scriptures. In other words, simply what Luther was saying, pick up the Word of God and study it. The Holy Spirit is there, always keeping the demonic away from you as you learn and read and hear the Word of God. It helps us against the devil, the world, and the flesh. It helps us to be occupied with words of God, to speak it to one another, to meditate on one another. Just as the psalmist declares us that we must meditate on it day and night. Certainly you will not release a stronger, greater repellent against the devil than be engaged by God's commandments, his words, and speak and sing, or think them. For this indeed is the true holy water, the holy sign from which the devil runs and by which he may be driven away. And for this reason alone, you ought gladly to read, speak to each other, think, and use the word of God among yourselves. You had no profit and fruit from them. Even though you might have trouble thinking it, God still is there for you. For the devil cannot hear or endure God's word. I read in a magazine recently, uh, who does studies on the Christian church. 27% of the people who now call themselves Christian attend church once a month. It just gets lower and lower. What do we do? Many of us are starting to think that the problem has always been as we go along, we don't think and read and discuss the Holy Scriptures and God's commands like we were supposed to. You think it through. All these people who are around us, some claiming to be Lutheran, but never darkening the door except Christmas and Easter. What happened? God does not require us and command us to study his word, but he wants us to do it with his purpose. He knows the dangers, he knows the needs that we have, and he knows the constant assault of the devil and his temptations on each and every one of us. He wants to warn us, equip us, and preserve us against them as being good armored up against the fiery darts with good medicine against the evil infection and temptation. So now, my dear baptized children of God, brothers and sisters in Christ, you too are being freed from the power of the evil one and his demons are sent around as you have asked so many times and continue to ask our Father in heaven that he deliver you. For you are still sitting at the feet of Jesus and doing what you are asking of your Father in heaven to do. That is, that his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Helping us to provide for our neighbor daily with daily bread. Forgiving our sins much and often. And deliver us from the power of the evil one. So in closing, let me just say this. I'll point you back to the beginning. Your baptism into Christ, his victory, his victorious life-giving giving death and resurrection, that is where God claimed you. That is where he put his almighty triune name upon you. That is where he marked you as one redeemed by Christ the Lord. That is where he is marking you as one who is beloved to his children, the heirs of salvation. God has declared it. No one. And nothing can snatch this blessing away from you. 
So then trust in this above all things. You've been baptized by the almighty triune God into Christ, and it's a baptism that is good for all eternity. In good times, in bad times, in better or worse, richer or poorer, in sickness and in health. Salvation is yours and absolutely free, unmerited, unearned because of Christ, Jesus, and his unconditional love for you. And following our communion with Christ in his very body and blood, he will once again place his benediction upon you. By which he is telling you, like he told the former demon-possessed man, return to your home and declare how much God has done for you. So as we go out this evening, depart in peace, dwell ever and safely and securely in the blessed truth and trust wholeheartedly in God's holy triune word and go and tell what God has done much for you. In the name of the Almighty, Triune, God the Father, God the Son, and the Holy Spirit, be and abide with you all. Amen.